Welcome to Crosstalk. I am so glad you joined us today because we have a very, very exciting program. So welcome and thanks for joining us in this journey of faith. been talking throughout this last weeks about the many, many topics from Genesis to Revelation that are there just to point us to the cross. We always talk about the cross in this program because actually Christ is the main theme of the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Now today we are going to talk about Joseph. Now Joseph's story is very important because it's the bridge between Genesis and all the patriarchs with the rest of the Bible and how God will use Joseph to preserve a nation that eventually would give the Messiah, the Jews. Now before we do that so that there is no confusion uh, on the difference between our calling and the gospel, I am going to read to you another passage. See, we need to find a structure so that we don't get confused because I have heard a lot of people that said that our calling, the way that God works through us, is the gospel. And it's not. The gospel stands on its own. The gospel is the cross of Jesus Christ. It's what he has done outside of us for us on our behalf. Now, those that are saved... Well, God has called them with a particular purpose, a calling to fulfill um, a function in this whole history of redemption. Now, this uh, particular garment that I have here, these are going to symbolize our calling. This is going to symbolize the gospel. There are two different things. Now, I want to give you a structure so that we don't get confused. And I'm going to take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We will see the difference between the gospel, what Jesus did for us, outside of us, on our behalf, and what he does in us for his glory to fulfill a mission. Now, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11, says something very interesting. No man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, this is the foundation. It's laid already. It's Jesus Christ. Now... The Holy Spirit starts building on that foundation in the life of the Christian. Verse 12. If any man builds on that foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw. See here we have different types of material. Each man's work will become evident for the day. We're talking about the end of times. Will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. Now check this out. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. So if you have built uh, with gold, silver, etc., you will receive a reward. But if a man's work is burned up, which means you built with hay, with straw, he will suffer great loss. He himself will be saved. That's interesting, isn't it? Because the reason why you are saved is because of Jesus Christ. But many people will be saved without their life having been profitable for God. So their work didn't remain. Now their salvation is not at stake because the salvation happens because they believed in Jesus Christ. But there will be many that will not fulfill the calling even though they're saved. Now, now that we have this structure, now we can talk about the calling so that we never get confused that I am doing this in order to be saved. I have been saved here. This is the way God uses me for his kingdom. Now we're going to go to the story of Joseph. Now the story of Joseph is the most dramatic story that we have in all of the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible and it has been crafted in a way that it gives us great insight on how God will um, guide Joseph through many different things. And don't forget, it's the bridge between Genesis and the patriarchs and Exodus and Israel and the rest of the Bible. Now, you will love this. Um, all of you know that he wears a multicolored robe at the beginning. But you see, 
the author of the story of Joseph has a robe for each stage of his life. Usually we don't talk about these two robes that much, but the robes symbolize the jobs and the different functions that Joseph has and how he, uh, the people see him with his robes on. But at the same time, each robe is accompanied by two dreams, two dreams, Two dreams, because robes are the ways that men see Joseph. The dreams are the way that God is guiding Joseph. It's, it's a fantastic story. Don't forget, a robe and two dreams, a robe and two dreams, and a robe and two dreams. So hopefully you are now ready to see how God uses us in his calling for us to have a part in, in uh, spreading the gospel, in this case in Joseph, preserving the nation of Israel. So, let's start on chapter 37 of Genesis. What a fantastic story. And I know you know the story very well, but I tell you, today we're going to learn a lot. So, as always, get your paper, get your pen, and let's start taking notes. What do you say? All right. Now, I'm going to wear the first robe. Everybody knows this robe. This is the robe, uh, the multicolored robe that we know about. Chapter 37 says on verse 3, Israel, Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a very colored tunic. Actually, the Hebrew says a richly ornamented tunic. We don't really know what it was. We just know that it was fantastic, but fantastically ornamented. Now, this was a, quite, quite a dysfunctional. This is quite a dysfunctional robe because, you see, He's a favorite of his father, and his, his, his uh, brothers can't even talk to him in friendly terms. Verse 4, his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. So this is the way that people see Joseph. He has this very colored, richly ornamented robe. And in the midst of this dysfunctionality, you thought that because uh, your family was dysfunctional, God couldn't use you. Well, I have news for you. God uses all of us, and actually there's quite a bit of dysfunction of families in the Bible. So here we have the two dreams. It's time for God to start steering Joseph to where he's going to be. Now he's wearing this robe, and he gets two dreams. And you know the dreams. He starts dreaming that, that all these this, uh, sheaves are actually bowing to him. But see, God hasn't yet given him the gift of interpreting dreams. So he cannot understand what that means. As a matter of fact, it seems like everybody else in his family has the gift of interpreting dreams because they ask him, what, are you going to rule over us? Really? Now, Joseph doesn't know what the dreams mean, but, but God has already put inside of him at the very beginning of his calling this, this uh, desire or this glimpse or this idea I'm sure you had those when you were a youth. You know, you remember something that you were, you were getting from God, but you didn't fully understand what it was. Well, it's very interesting because Joseph will, will go to see his brothers. Now, he will go to see his brothers, and something very interesting is going to happen. He will go, verse 12, then his brothers went to the pasture, to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. Now, Shechem is a little place uh, close to Sikar and close to Dothan. Now, this whole area where Joseph will be sold is, is really interesting because this whole area where he will be sold is actually the area that will be given to him as his own inheritance later on. So this very, very area, the geographical area where, where Joseph will be sold is eventually the land that he will actually own. Many times our lives are like that. They come full circle and then we understand that we were in the right place, but it didn't feel like it at the very beginning. See, remember John 4? Uh, our next time we're going to talk about the Samaritan woman. Uh, John 4 where Samaritan woman uh, episode happens, it actually uh, happens by the well that Jacob gave to his father Joseph because this was a little uh, village of Sikar right next to Shechem where Dothan was a, a few miles away. So this whole area, interesting, isn't it? That at the end of his life, Joseph will own the very land where they now sell him. Well, you know what happened. They take his garment away from him. 
And they do something very interesting with this garment. We are told, in verse 31, they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in blood. And they came to Joseph with this garment that Joseph now is no longer wearing because he's going to go to the next stage in his calling. And now the deceiver, Jacob, is deceived by his own children because the currency that you actually use at home is the currency that your children will use with you later on. So here we have him coming to Egypt. Now, this would be a very, very sad chapter if we didn't get a glimpse that he's closer to his dream than he's ever been, but he doesn't know that. Chapter 37, verse 36. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him to, in Egypt to Potiphar. Potiphar was Pharaoh's officers, it says here, the captain of the bodyguard. So we know the end of the story. We know he's getting closer and closer and closer, and it's just that Pharaoh... It's right next to him because Potiphar works for Pharaoh, but Joseph didn't know his destiny yet. So he comes to Potiphar's wife. Uh, uh, yeah, he will <laughs> have a problem with his wife, but for now he's in his house. And he is the overseer. Now the overseer, of course, has his own garment of overseer. And we will see that the whole narrative of Joseph in the house of Potiphar goes around this garment that he's wearing now. Well, we are told in chapter 39 that even though he was in slavery, the Lord was with Joseph, verse 2, and he became a successful man. And Potiphar said, okay, you are a slave, but I'm going to put you in charge of everything. Now, I would like to tell you that you can go from the robe of your calling to the investiture robe where you fulfill your dream without going through the one in the middle, but you can't. Every time in the Bible where God is going to use somebody mightily, they go through this robe of training and suffering. There is no shortcuts on this. So here is Joseph. He's the overseer, of course. We see the, the word overseer. It says on verse 4, Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him an overseer over his house and all that he owned. And he put him in charge. We know that he will be the overseer of Egypt, but he didn't know that. It is in this state that you're getting your abilities that you will need later to fulfill, actually, what God has in mind. He, he, he will use this time to train you. And, of course, Potiphar said, you can have everything except my wife. And the wife said, hello, I want to be included. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. The wife said to Joseph, come lie with me, have sex with me. And... Joseph said, no, I couldn't did, do this to Potiphar or to my God. See, in, in this time, your integrity is, is tested very much. It is in your suffering and your training that your integrity is also tested. Not only are, are you getting the abilities, but your emotional health and your spiritual health um, are being uh, tested in some way to move you to the last part of your calling. Well, you know what happened. She caught him. By his garment. Now you know, you think that by now Joseph doesn't want to wear any more garments because every time he has one, somebody takes them from him. She takes him by the garment, and the whole narrative that follows is the garment. Verse 12 She caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment, and the garment became exhibit A. And so she's holding the garment, and she's saying, Look what he did. He tried to rape me. And so the garment throws. Joseph in jail, even though he did the right thing. Now, it is in jail during this time that they again put him as an overseer. <laughs> because, of course, God is training him to be the overseer of Egypt. But it is during this time of suffering and training that actually God gives him a spiritual gift as well. He anoints him with a gift. And now... Joseph will be given the gift to interpret dreams. And so during this time of this garment of suffering and training, in jail, the two men have the two dreams. Remember? The cupbearer and the baker dream things, and God gives him the gift of spiritual, the spiritual gift of interpreting dreams. Now, it's very interesting that this would be a very sad time in Joseph's life 
very much just suffering. If it wasn't for a little clue that we get here. Chapter 39, verse 20. Joseph's master took him and put him in the jail. We all knew that, right? But check this out. The place, this is not ordinary jail, is the place where the king's prisoners were confined. This is the royal jail. Of, why? Well, because Potiphar was an officer of Pharaoh. So when he had to put his servant in jail, he put him in the jail of Pharaoh where the, 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 the king's servants came. Of course, is it in this place that God will make the connection for the last part of his calling? It is right here that he will make the connection for the last part of his calling. But he doesn't know that. All he knows is that he's enslaved and he's in jail. But it's the royal jail. And you might be right here right now saying, you know, I am right here. I am in this place. You know, we call this the cocoon, you know. You stop being a caterpillar, you'll, you'll become a butterfly, and you're in the cocoon. And the cocoon is a dark, cold place that seems like nothing's happening. But the truth is, it's a tomb and it's a womb, because it's a tomb of the caterpillar, but it's a womb of the butterfly. And so here Joseph is getting his identity that God will use so powerfully later. He's in the royal jail. Yes, but it's a jail, right? No, it's the royal jail. God will make the connection in here for him to go here. Well, the time has come. And actually, Joseph asked him in chapter 40, verse 14, Keep me in mind. <laughs> Please, says to the cupbearer, don't forget me. But he forgets him. And we have chapter 41, verse 1. It happened that at the end of two full years. <laughs> you know, I told you in the past that I have had a lot of trouble with God's timing. Because, you know, I would like him to rush sometimes. Have you ever experienced that? Well, here Joseph is experiencing this. He would like it to be a little faster, but two full years go. And then we get the two dreams. Don't forget that each stage has two dreams. So... Pharaoh has two dreams this time. And the true dreams uh, are, of course, the prophecy about what will happen in the next 14 years for Egypt. But nobody knows what it is. Oh, the cupbearer says, I knew a Hebrew youth, chapter 41, verse 12. A Hebrew youth was with us uh, in the royal jail. And he told us exactly what would happen. He interpreted our dream. And Pharaoh said, get him. Now, Pharaoh said to Joseph, verse 15, I have had a dream. No one can interpret it. And I have heard it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not me. See, a very specific characteristic of the third robe of when you actually get to do your calling is that you are absolutely certain that it is not you. <laughs> you can't, if somebody says, well, you're such a great preacher, you're such a great speaker, you go, no, 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 you don't understand. I still can't figure out why God chose me for this. It, it, it's his doing. He has decided this. It's not me. And so Joseph is saying, no, 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 he says, it's not me. It is not me, verse 16. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. It's not, <laughs> don't ever think it's me, says Joseph. So Pharaoh gives him the dream, and God gives Joseph the interpretation. And verse 33 says, on chapter 41 of Genesis, Let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise, says Joseph. Now, I would like to tell you, I just uh, came back from, uh, from Egypt a few weeks ago. And for the first time, I stood there in front of those temples and, and, and in front of those monuments and, and the wealth of this empire. I mean, it's just incredible of this, uh, whatever we want to call it. The, the Egypt was the biggest thing at that time. And just to think <laughs> that Joseph came and said, uh, I have an advice for you. <laughs> Yes, Pharaoh, I know you're the most powerful man in the whole world, but I have an advice. See, Joseph at this time not only will give him, um, first of all, the interpretation of the dream, second, the prophecy of the next 14 years, but he will give him advice 
how to oversee Egypt during this time to save the whole world from famine. At this moment, Pharaoh recognizes that it is God who is doing it, that this is not Joseph. And he says, on chapter 41, verse 38, Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this? Verse 38, in whom is a divine spirit? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has informed you of all of this, since God has given you this gift, since, since God has anointed you with this, well, he says, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. Verse 42, Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him with a garment of fine linen and put a gold necklace around his neck. And this is the third garment in the story of Joseph. Now he is going to fulfill the calling that he had for him. But look all that he went through here. Yes, that's, that's how God guides us. As we train, as we understand, as we get new abilities, as we get spiritual gifts, this is all for his glory. We have a little spot that he gives us in the whole history of redemption. And in, in this case, Joseph comes to be the overseer of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. And he preserves not only Egypt, but the nation of Israel and of the whole world in this case because of famine. There is nothing, absolutely nothing in this life like living the calling that God gave you because it gives you joy and it gives you passion and it gives you energy no matter what you're going through because God gives you this. It's not yours. Now you know that there are many, there are many uh, typologies in the Old Testament about Jesus. There are many things that talk about um, people that eventually will be symbols of Jesus Christ. Well, Joseph is a very powerful um, typology of Jesus. First of all, it is in the story of Joseph that for the first time we will see the word remnant in our Bibles. Because Joseph will explain to his brothers that actually God was preserving a remnant through him and that God actually sent him there to do that. And chapter 45 of Genesis, when he's talking to his brothers on verse 7, he says, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in this earth. This is in our English Bibles, the first time we actually find the word remnant. See, Joseph realizes that this is not him, that God had a plan all along. Well, the story of Jesus um, is told also in garments in the Gospels. You know, the swaddling clothes of the humble manger, the, the, the robe of his training and suffering as he is at the cross. And, and they robe him with, with this uh, symbolic robe of a king and they spit on him and they hid him. But perhaps the most amazing robe that we have of Jesus is the one that he's going to be wearing in the second coming. Did you know that we are told what he's going to be wearing in the second coming? Because the garments are very important in the Bible. They symbolize great things. Chapter 19 of, um, of Revelation has the second coming of Jesus, starting on verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems. And look what he's wearing. Verse 13. Chapter 19 of Revelation. Verse 13. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. See, we can never forget what was Jesus calling. Jesus was the only savior of the world. And when he comes to get us, he is wearing a robe that has been dipped in blood. And this is a sentence that comes from the story of Joseph. Now, if you remember, this robe came um, dipped in blood to Jacob. But of course, it was a little animal um, uh, that was killed for this robe to be dipped in blood. But, but this one, no, this is his own blood. He is wearing a robe dipped in blood when he comes for us. So we don't forget ever what was his calling. His calling was to save us. Now, I want to tell you something. I don't know 
what you're facing in your life today. I don't know if you are in this robe, or in this robe, or in this robe. Now, this is the robe that saves us, not these. This is our calling. But I want to encourage you, no matter where you are, to take heart knowing that the robe of righteousness of Christ covers you. Whether you're just starting in your calling and you don't fully understand what it is, or whether you are in your robe of suffering at this time, or whether you are just having the great ple pleasure and privilege of living fully in your calling at this time. No matter where you are, the assurance of your salvation comes from his robe of righteousness. It is with this robe that, that all the topics that we've been talking about so far are symbolized. Because see, here, the Passover lamb <laughs> covers you. And it is in this robe that Jesus sees, that God sees you through the perfect righteousness of his son. Not yours. It is, it is this robe that saves you. So that no matter where you are, where there is at the beginning, or there where it is in suffering, or whether it is in your full calling. You are assured of your salvation. You never lose this. You see, because that was his calling to save you. Very soon, he's going to come for us. He's going to be wearing a robe dipped in blood. Yes, his own blood. To remind us what he did for us, and how he fulfilled his calling of being the savior of the world. Now you in this assurance, covered by his righteousness, now go live for his glory. Not because you're afraid or because you're trying to earn your salvation through all of this. No, 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 this is done. But because you have been set free and because you understand you're saved, now live fully for his glory. Now go do what he has put in your heart to do. Go do the abilities that he gave you to do. See, to save the world, that was his calling. Now, in the assurance of your salvation, go <laughs> and do your calling and have your place in the history of redemption of the world. Well, this is Crosstalk, where we talk about Christ and Him crucified. We'll see you next time. God bless you.